Good morning, Trinity Bible Church family and friends. I'm sitting here in my study at my house, Palm Sunday, as we reflect on Palm Sunday today, 2020, Palm Sunday 2020, and we've reached another one. And uh, so it's exciting to be able to share during this special week, even though we're not together at our church facility, we are together, and we're together around the Word of God. Uh, a while back, someone pinned these words, and we think about the world in which we live. Think about this. It's called In the Midst of Calamity. Satan says, I will cause anxiety, fear, and panic. I will shut down schools, places of worship, and sports events. I will cause economic turmoil. Jesus says, I will bring together neighbors, restore the family unit. I will bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. That was actually written by C.S. Lewis in 1942 during the uh, Second World War. So has anything really ever changed? Satan is always walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus is always there for us and trying to get our attention and trying to teach us things that how we need to really live in the light in the, of the world in which we live. Um, you, can, you can turn with me, if you like, to Matthew 21, 1 through 11. We're going to look at that in a little bit. And to kind of bring up, bring that up, here's an illustration from a little boy who was sick on Palm Sunday, stayed home from church with his mother. His father returned from church holding a palm branch. And the little boy was curious, and he asked, why do you have that palm branch, Dad? Well, you see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches today. The little boy replied, ah, shucks. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. Well, I hope Jesus is at your house today. If he's living in your life, he's certainly there. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And even though we're not together, he's here with us. Where, where we are, he is in our midst. You understand that. Let me read, and you can follow along, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And I read, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and one, and once you will find, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was written through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, See your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Well, the disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's just bow together in a, in a thought of prayer this morning as we speak with the Lord. Lord, I thank you for what we remember today, that day that uh, you rode the donkey into the city of Jerusalem, uh, a few days before you went to the cross. And Lord, I just pray that we'll understand a little bit more about this, maybe a new and a fresh today, in what you've done for us as we look into the Word. Be with our church family. I pray for John Moore and his family today. Be with them and him in a special way, Lord. We we know that, uh, again, you're in control of our lives, and we just pray for your will to be done in every area of our lives. I pray that uh, no one else uh, will... Uh, uh, get 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 very sick in this time, and I just pray, Lord, that you'll help everyone to be able to stay on top of it and to walk with you. And I pray for the Word of God today as we look at the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, reading Matthew 21, we get a sense of the crowd's delirious excitement over the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem. So my message is entitled today, Blessed is He Who Comes in the Name of the Lord. 
they were reciting hymns actually from the Hallel or Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, which are songs of praise that were as familiar to them as Christmas carols are to us as they shouted out Hosanna. Those songs were their seasonal hymns. And you can sense that it was a rock and rolling praise gathering to God, it seems like. Cloaks and branches laid on the road. You know, I'm kind of wondering, maybe maybe uh, the idea of who's going to clean up that mess. I wonder if the city street cleaners would like that very much. But, you know, I, I digress this morning. Kind of just a human thought. As we get back to the action here, we see the crowds lining the streets. Great commotion. The Bible says the whole city was stirred. The whole city. And why was this happening? Matthew was explicit in reporting the significance. Again, I read, he took this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say through the to the daughters of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So this being Palm Sunday, the day taken from the Gospels, where a whole city threw a parade for Jesus. The whole city threw a parade for Jesus. And as Jesus rode into the city, the people threw palm branches in anticipation of his coming. Thus we get the word Palm Sunday. This day marked a time of celebration where Jesus was worshipped in praise. But this day is bittersweet for us because even as we read of the celebration, we know that Friday is coming. In fact, on Friday uh, this week, I'll give you a, a, a special message about Good Friday. And we'll give you the particulars on how to tune in on that. So we're going to reflect on that on Good Friday. But as we think about Good Friday, you see, the cross is coming. We know that many in the same crowd will, within a few days, exchange words of praise to words of death, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and then shouting, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. This passage is about the fulfillment of what was written this long time ago, a fulfilled, a fulfilled prophecy right before your very eyes. It was about the re re arrival of a king, really a gentle king, who rides on a donkey, a colt. So Matthew is concerned that people who hear this story or read this story, for us today even, get this connection. In other words, Matthew is saying, would you follow this king that I'm telling you about? Would you follow this king that I'm telling you about? This is no coincidence. This is divine appointment. This is not some haphazard con job. This is the king who comes to you, just as it was predicted some 500 years ago by the prophet Zechariah. Now, let's suppose this morning we are watching an Eagles game. Boy, it would be nice to be able to watch some sports right now, wouldn't it? But let's suppose this Eagles game is a sellout. Most of them are. Every seat is taken, jam-packed. They are closing in on a playoff spot, so it's a crucial game. Talk about electricity in the air. Can't even get a hot dog. Mile-long lineup. I pity the toilet cleaners cleaning messes left by the thousands. Every pitch, every swing was, eat was eaten by the cheering crowd. They anticipated a big win against the Dallas Cowboys. Just to, th to be there would have been an experience, would be an experience. Well, I think the same thing with Palm Sunday. This feverish, loud celebration was all about the Jewish expectation of a Messiah. Electricity in the air, anticipation of a great win. This is like closing in on the playoffs. They are expecting you see a political Messiah who will make life great for the Jews once again. They have experienced desperate times, foreign control, Roman rule for over 150 years, and they are fed up. They were supportive of terrorist groups that undermined the Romans. They were looking for a change in government, a revolt, a violent overthrow of the Roman conquerors. And in shouting Hosanna, they were in effect saying, save us now, Jesus. Now, naturally, great crowds came to hear his message. A wave of religious and political expectations swept the, swept the country. And that is why Matthew said the whole city was stirred. Jesus, you see, would be that difference maker. But we know now that the crowd's hopes were not realized. They turned on him within the space of, a fi of five days and shouted, Crucify him rather than Hosanna. The Messiah they celebrated on Sunday, they would hang on the cross on Friday. So let's build on this and reflect a number of things. 
The first thing I want you to see this morning is Jesus' journey, our journey. Jesus' journey, our journey. What was this event of Palm, Palm Sunday got to do with us today? What has this got to do with us today? The significance of Palm Sunday is not merely to remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It is our own journey as well. The journey for all who follow him and call him Lord. Jesus' journey eventually led him to the cross where he'd suffer and die a painful and humiliating death. Now you may wonder if this is our journey as well. Is it necessary for followers of Jesus to go to the cross? Back in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 16, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said that this was a correct answer. Jesus said that this answer was revealed by God the Father. There, there is no mystery anymore. None of Jesus' associates can say who is that mass-bearded man. Is it a bird or a plane? No, Jesus was clear. He was very clear. He is the Messiah, the Christ. However, immediately after that, we are told that he was clear about his mission in Matthew 16, 21. So from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Uh, no, his, so his disciples were not overjoyed with that plan. That he must suffer and be killed? What kind of a stupid plan was that? Weren't the Jews supposed to be liberated when the king comes? Isn't life supposed to get better not to be suffered, not to suffer and to be killed? In fact, it was recorded that Peter gave Jesus a hard time over this. Peter actually took the Messiah, whom he just confessed aside, and he scolded him. But look at Jesus' response again in Matthew 16, 24. He says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. If anyone would come after me, think about that now. If He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The journey then of Jesus must include the cross. It was the Father's plan. It was the only plan to save the world. And it was always the plan, according to the written scriptures, that his blood would be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This was his appointment his destiny as a servant king, which Matthew carefully noted with numerous Old Testament quotations showing that Jesus is the Messiah. So make mo no, no mistake about it. This is the king. This Palm Sunday, I'd like to invite each one of us to check our spiritual temperatures or to reflect, if you will, on your spiritual journey. The disciples and the crowd thought about everything in life, that everything in life would turn up roses right away. They have seen miracles by Jesus, powerful preaching. Surely this means he will stomp on the enemies now. And I wonder if that's how we are excited too. I want you to think about that. I wonder if that's how we are excited too. God, only if you would save me now from my problems, from my sickness, sickness, from this mess, save me now. But when he has other plans with our problems, do we also say, crucify him? Do we give up so easily? I wonder if we've lost the voice of Jesus who said, come after me. Remember, he said, come after me. He said, deny yourself. It will be a crucified life. It'll be a cross life. It'll be humiliating. It'll be suffering stuff. That's what he said. But are we like Peter? Can't better hear that and say no way, and would take Jesus aside and scold him for not following our plans to give our lives an easy street. That would be, most of the time, our plans to have that easy street. So Jesus' journey is really our journey. Secondly, Jesus' kingship or our kingship? Now, how can it be any other way? Isn't the way of the kingdom one that looks a lot like rah, rah, victory all the way rather than defeat? How can it be Christians still lose the way of weakness, the way of the cross? That's a huge stumbling block. Losing your life to save it, losing the world and its toys, but gaining your soul? 
What kind of plan is that? Now, Jesus goes on to teach that the way of the kingdom is very much like a gentle king on a donkey. So he consistently taught, if you think about it, and we see this in Matthew 18, 4, be like a little child, be like a little kid. Jesus says, whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourself like a little child to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. Isn't greatness about a macho conquering hero with full body armor riding on a stallion, a real war horse? Yet, he came humbly riding on a donkey. The way of the kingdom, who can understand this? Ninety sheep, we're told, is left, and one wanders away. The owner is happy to leave the ninety-nine and go find that one sheep, Matthew eighteen ten through 14. What kind of shepherd is that? Is this really good business? Well, you might say it's bad math. Yes, yet that's what Jesus taught. How many times shall I forgive them? Someone, sin, someone sins against me when they sin against me. One time sure is enough, right? But 70 times 7? How can I demi, deny myself and choose a cross life? It was bad math, if you think about it, to that rich young ruler, that rich young man, when he was told to sell his possessions and give to the poor. Sell my stuff? Give it away? That's bad accounting. What business school did you go to? But Jesus said this, give up your houses, your family ties now, and you'll get a hundred times more. First, last, last will be first. Huh? Sounds like bad math again, doesn't it? Whoever wants to be great, he said in Matthew 20, needs to be a slave. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No wonder the religious people got upset. No wonder tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners loved him. Do you think God is more concerned that we follow his kingly rule rather than what we dictate to him? Did he ever say, follow me and you'll be happy and you'll hit the jackpot? Or is, follow me and take up your cross, come and die and you'll live? Is God in charge? Is he the eternal king? And will he be glorified in my life and your life as God? So Jesus' journey, our journey. Jesus' kingship, our kingship. And thirdly, the question really is this. Who will follow Jesus all the way? Who will follow? Who will follow him? Not just follow him, but follow him all the way. Let me give you some thoughts on this. So who will follow? Shall we follow the crowd and get excited because it looks like a problem will be solved now? Hosanna, save now from all my problems. Or, secondly, shall we follow Jesus as king? He commands, we've seen this and we're seeing this, a different way on a donkey, proclaiming grace and peace, building a community, a church that is peace-loving, not warlike, forgiving, giving of self. Are we following him? Are we following him? Thirdly, shall we pour out our agenda rather than his kingdom agenda? Fourthly, Shall we follow our fickle feelings that one day is excited and next day down in the dumps? Or shall we follow the unchanging, everlasting, unchanging plan and purpose of God? Isn't it scary, you might ask, to be like the crowd on Palm Sunday? Well, let me, th let, let me think about this. And my fifth thought here on this is, are we coming to him with preconceived notions of God's rulership? And so cloud our mind that we can't see what God is doing? Is that like us? Are we coming to him with preconceived notions of God's rulership? And so cloud our mind or close our mind and can't see what God is doing? Sixthly, have we resisted Jesus' rulership like the religious know-it-all, scripture-quoting religious leaders of Jesus' day? They were the ones who thought they were the epitome of God's servants. They were the ones who knew it all, and everybody else was to be subservient to them. But they resisted Jesus' rulership. Instead of embracing a cross-carrying life of a humble servant king who can serve others, even if it means painful death awaits, are we willing, willing to, uh, to give in to his rulership, to his kingship? Seventhly, Matthew takes plans to takes pains to include old, the Old Testament fulfillment of Jesus. He's encouraging faith that God is actively working out his 
agenda, his rulership in a world that is in opposition to him. So he refers to the Old Testament fulfilling of Jesus being the Messiah and the King. I believe God wants to encourage our flagging faith. He wants us to have a celebratory worship life. God is active. He's fulfilling his promises. Are we there? Are we, are we seeing that? Are we recognizing that? Jesus enjoyed the celebration, but the religious types were indignant. You see this in Matthew 21, verse 15. Are there promises to claim, and do we celebrate his promises fulfilled? And he's fulfilled so many of them in our lives, past, present, and he's going to fill so many in the future. Number eight, Jesus, you see, was single-minded. He went to Jerusalem knowing he would be killed. The way of his kingdom now includes suffering. How prepared are we for that kind of Christ-likeness? Jesus called for the life of taking up our cross, following him, which calls being selfless like the master was selfless, serving others. He said that's what greatness is. Or we just, or we just got that ticket to heaven and never mind becoming like him, the servant king. No, no, we just want that ticket to heaven. In fact, I don't really think there's such a thing as just a ticket to heaven. We must recognize him and believe in him and trusting him as our savior. And we must claim him as our Lord and the king of kings of our lives. Or are we so blinded, want the world and its temporal rewards so much that we lose our soul over it? Will you have Jesus? Will you, will you have, will you follow Jesus and delay gratification now and get what he promises to be a hundredfold reward and eternal life? It's a big thought. But it's an important thing that we reflect on, but not just reflect on it. Do something about it. Number nine, always come as you are. And we are sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, Matthew 21, 31 through 34. The self-sufficient religious types of Jesus did not come. They didn't really even think of themselves much as sinners. They, uh, they came in their self-righteousness, the self-righteous religious types. Our as you are needy, we are all needy, without pretense, without excusing bad behavior, following him who showed the way to greatness. Shall we reject man-made righteousness and receive God's righteousness through faith in Jesus? I trust today that if you're listening and watching this and you don't know the Lord, that you don't rely upon your own righteousness because the Bible says they are as filthy rags because we are sinners and we need a Savior and Jesus came on that Palm Sunday. He walked down that road on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. And then he went to that cross just a few days later. He died for you and for me that he, that our righteousness might be, that his righteousness might come to us, that we might have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in us. Number, number 10. Do we, do we live for the praise, adulation, and adoration of people? Or of God? Do we live for the praise, adulation, and adoration of people or of God? As I said earlier, the significance of Palm Sunday is not merely for us to remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It is our journey as well to follow him to the cross, to Good Friday, and not abandon his call, the life of the suffering servant king. Will we journey with Jesus our Lord? Jesus is king. Matthew leaves no room, no doubt otherwise about that. He came. He died to secure for us forgiveness of sins. But that's not the end. Thank God that's not the end. He arose from the dead and promises he will be with us to the end. He is the king. He is the king. A story is, a story is told of a little girl who, while walking in a garden, noticed a particularly beautiful flower. She admired its beauty and enjoyed its fragrance. Oh, it's so pretty, she exclaimed. And as she gazed on it, her eyes followed the stem down to the soil in which it grew. This flower is so pretty to be planted in such dirt, she cried. So she pulled it up by its roots and ran to the water faucet to wash away the soil. It wasn't long until the flower wilted and died. And when the gardener saw what the little girl had done, he exclaimed, you have destroyed my finest plant. I'm sorry, but I didn't like it in that dirt, she said. And then the gardener replied, I chose that spot 
and mix the soil because I knew that only there could it grow to be a beautiful flower. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. God has placed us exactly where we are today, even though everything is going on with this coronavirus and all the anxiety and all the difficulties and people losing their jobs and people getting sick and people dying. God has placed us exactly where we are on Palm Sunday in the year 2020. He has placed us right where we are, and we must trust him. And in the trusting, we eventually see that he is using our pressures and our trials and our difficulties to bring us to a new degree of spiritual beauty. God is trying to make in us that beautiful flower. True contentment, true contentment comes when we accept what God is doing and we thank him for it. Let me say it again. True contentment comes when we accept what God is doing and we thank him for it. So this morning, is your faith casual or committed? And as we approach this week where our where our Lord Jesus suffered incredibly for us, in a week where our sins, past, present, and future, were nails, were nails that hung him on, the, on that cross, doesn't Jesus deserve a second look if you've looked at him but you really haven't trusted in him? Doesn't he deserve total control of your life if you've trusted in him for salvation but you haven't allowed him to control your entire life? You're not, you, he really isn't the Lord day by day in your life? Do you realize that he was to have he wants to have a personal relationship with you? We know that when we come to know the Lord and we enter into that personal relationship with him. If you don't know the Lord, you can enter into a personal relationship with him even right now while you're listening or watching this broadcast. You can do that. And as we know the Lord on this Palm Sunday, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we can honor him as Lord. And we can acknowledge him as Lord and say from this day forward, Lord, I want you to rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in my life. This week, consider it all and choose to give it all to him. This, mail, this message certainly has challenged me in these days, and I hope it has challenged you. I have to ask, am I really following Jesus? Are you really following Jesus? Or am I and you just tolerating him or worst? Or worse yet, telling him to follow me. Will I say, Hosanna one minute and then crucify him the next? Don't know what God is doing in your heart. I don't know that. Only God knows that and you know that. But please, today, come to the gentle king. If you will, pray silently first. And then with me, as we dedicate ourselves to the servant king. So let's just have a moment of silence as you pray there in your house or wherever you are. Pray and talk to the Lord about all these matters. Lord, I thank you so much that you loved us with that eternal, everlasting love. So much so that you left heaven's glory and you came to this earth. The King of kings and Lord of lords, heaven's glory, came to this old earth with all its problems and difficulties. And you walked upon this earth, and in the 33rd year of your life, you rode into the city of Jerusalem, and a few days later, you went to that cruel Roman cross, and you died for the sins of the world, past, present, and future. And then, Lord, thankfully, as you promised, you arose again from the dead, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And, Lord, you're coming back, as we've been studying. We know you're coming back. But, Lord, I pray that e each one of us will invite you, if we have not done that, into our heart and life to be Savior and Lord, and that will acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords from this day forward. Lord, I want to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you sing with me the song? You know the song. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. 
Maybe we could be singing that song throughout our day and throughout the week. We'll come back together on Good Friday for a, a message reflecting on what our Lord has done for us. And then, Lord willing, again on Easter Sunday. God bless you, folks. I love you, and I'm praying for you. God bless.